Broadcasting from the UK and across the world online, you're now watching the UK's only alternative late night talk show, and I'm your host, Kevin Moore. Now, on today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, Paul Davids. Now, this interview was originally taped in the early part of 2017, and it was just discovered recently that it wasn't broadcast, so... I'm putting this out there now, a year later. Um, it was a fascinating interview with Paul as we talked about declassifying Marilyn Monroe. Now, just to give you a bit of background on Paul Davies, his films are known for controversy, beginning with Roswell, which starred Martin Sheen. It was a 1994 nominee for the Golden Globes as the best TV motion picture, which he executive produced and co-wrote as a Showtime original movie. Now, it dealt with the issues of extraterrestrial life and that prompted the truth embargo on the subject of E.T. contact. Now, Paul attended the American Film Institute Center for Advanced Film Studies in Beverly Hills. He began his career as a film script reader for an Hollywood agent and got his first break as a production coordinator of the original Transformers TV show for Marvel Productions back in 1985. Now, Paul went on to produce and direct another 10 feature films, mainly distributed by NBC Universal International Television and mostly dealing with controversial subjects. Now, his latest documentary deals with Marilyn Monroe and is called Marilyn Monroe Declassified. And more information can be found at MarilynDeclassified.com. So enjoy my interview with Paul. Well, Paul Davids, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. Thank you for having me back on. Yeah, because we were just talking off air there. It was May time when you were on previously and I was saying to you uh, off air there that uh, I believe I must have seen you on some other talk show discussing Marilyn Monroe now I know when we previously did our last interview that was something I think that was already in the can that you'd already done the actual um, uh, movie itself well, well the documentary so I thought I'll just get you back on just to talk about that so thanks for coming back on Sure. Well, as I remember in May, because uh, I had two major projects this year, there was the book An Atheist in Heaven had come out. Uh, that was the follow on to my movie, The Life After Death Project. So we talked about that in May. Now, at that time, uh, Marilyn Monroe Declassified hadn't been released yet. So Film Rise in New York picked up Marilyn Monroe Declassified and they released it in the U.S. Um, in September. So uh, it's not released worldwide, although I do make the DVD available as a Blu-ray uh, worldwide to people that go to uh, the website for the, the show, MarilynDeclassified.com. It's a way to get it if you're outside the United States on Blu-ray. So I'll link uh, the previous interview below this video uh, for those who want to get a bit of background on yourself as well. So how did you actually get involved in the Marilyn Monroe case? Well, it, it happened uh, sort of by chance. I knew some agents in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, who had gotten access to the original very large negatives of Marilyn Monroe's famous calendar pose, the nude calendar pose that they called Golden Dreams. Uh, and I was invited to get to film these with uh, their owner, um, Albert Babbitt, from Las Vegas, as he explained the whole history of them and uh, how it was that Marilyn did that nude pose and how it affected her career at a time when uh, its release coincided with a few of her really big movies coming out. So that was an interesting part of her history. But when I started with that, very quickly it came to my attention that there were people connected with uh, Marilyn and her history uh, very, very upset about the way the circumstances of her death were officially handled. And uh, the more I dug into it, I saw many books had been written on the topic and that there were objections to the official, um, the official judgment was probable suicide. This was uh, back in 1962, uh, a year before the assassination of President Kennedy. And um, the... Uh, the phrase probable suicide, it's almost never mentioned. It means they don't really know. You know, they're guessing. There was no suicide note. And I soon learned there had been objections to that by uh, the police, uh, particularly the policeman who was first at the scene, 
back in 1962. He didn't think it was a suicide even then. There have been a lot of books written. There have been documentaries made. And what I discovered was that no one had really put it all together. All of the evidence available, the testimony, uh, the different people who were involved, who changed their stories over the years. And the really big thing was that there has in more recent years been a release of FBI classified documents on Maryland. Declassification. It's why I call the movie Marilyn Monroe Declassified. And there's also a key CIA document on her. So I felt this was an opportunity to put it all together like no one had before and see if the riddle of the circumstance of her death could be solved once and for all. And uh, Kevin, I do believe that I've accomplished that in Marilyn Monroe Declassified. Okay, interesting. And um, what were you able to learn that others that have researched or investigated Marilyn Monroe were, were not, not able to ascertain? <clears throat> Quite a bit. The problem has been, there has been a lot of really relevant uh, evidence out through the years, but it's in snippets, a little bit on one talk show, a little bit on another documentary, a uh, book comes forward that offers uh, another piece of the puzzle. Um, so in putting it together, the main thing that impresses itself is that Marilyn was under intense surveillance for years by the FBI and the CIA, both of which had wiretapped her. And this is really confirmed. We know who the wiretappers are. They've, some of them, they've talked about their story we know that when her house sold after her death, that the new owners said that the house had been wired to the hilt. So you have the question of why was Marilyn targeted? Who was watching all of her phone calls and her activities? And why? And you start to build the pieces of the puzzle to see that both the FBI and the CIA had an interest in her ever since her marriage to playwright Arthur Miller, who was communist-leaning who was in trouble with the House uh, Un-American Activities Committee back in those days. Then you get to see that the mob took an interest in Marilyn uh, intensely, particularly when she became involved with President Kennedy, because the mob in the U.S. Uh, loathed the Kennedys. Bobby Kennedy, as Attorney General, was going after them with uh, a vengeance, like a vendetta. And uh, the mob felt betrayed because actually through the pleadings of the Kennedy patriarch, Joseph Kennedy, uh, the mob had actually helped put uh, John F. Kennedy in the White House. So when Marilyn became uh, involved with John F. Kennedy, she was making herself vulnerable in a way that she had, she had no idea because then she was also a target of the mob as a way to harm John F. Kennedy and his brother. So these are the pieces that started to come together. Then I learned about uh, a confession of a top mobster in the U.S. Uh, through his family after he was deceased. Sam Giancana was assassinated. He was, I think, found shot eight times in his own home. Um, but family members came out later with, with, with pieces of his story and his confession that he had ordered a hit on Marilyn Monroe, but that he had done it at the behest of the CIA. He had been working with the CIA in any event on the uh, anti-Fidel uh, Castro efforts. There were efforts to assassinate Fidel Castro, and the CIA enlisted the mob as sort of their arm's length uh, hit squad. So I began to find evidence that made that confession very, very credible that put together the pieces that showed the CIA interest, uh, their use of the mob as a hit squad, their, what they were learning from the wiretaps of Marilyn Monroe that had them very worried, particularly James Angleton, the head of counterintelligence at the CIA. So uh, like a jigsaw puzzle and a great murder mystery, as I made Marilyn Monroe declassified, all the pieces began to assemble very neatly and interlocking and uh, we could conclude that Marilyn was, was murdered. She was the victim of a hit. And that the hit was orchestrated in a way that the mob hoped that it could actually do 
damage, serious damage to Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Uh, because at that point he was involved with Marilyn. He had been at her home that day. His fingerprints would have been found in her house. Uh, at least the mob assumed that. So you have uh, all of these different motives and these players involved. At a time in history, uh, about, as I said, about a year before the assassination of JFK, when these, uh, these tensions and these vendettas were building up and, and becoming absolutely fierce. Well, why was Marilyn so um, surrounded by men of power then, in a sense? Well, you know, she attracted powerful men, like they say, the moth to the flame. And uh, like the, uh, the wonderful uh, song, you know, Candle in the Wind, you live your life like a candle in the wind. Uh, so like the wonderful Elton John a song, uh, Candle in the Wind. Uh, Marilyn, you know, she attracted uh, powerful men. Um, you know, she, she was married to uh, Joe DiMaggio, a very famous uh, baseball player, New York Yankees. And when that marriage didn't work out, she went to Arthur Miller. She was marrying one of the greatest playwrights alive. And then she had the occasion to meet John F. Kennedy. It was at Peter Lawford's Malibu Beach House. Now, Peter Lawford was brother-in-law to President Kennedy. He used to have parties there all the time. And when she met John F. Kennedy, uh, they became involved. Uh, there was an affair. It's been very, very well documented. He had many mistresses. And, uh, you know, I just want to digress a minute to say, sure. or jump ahead, to say that uh, one of uh, John F. Kennedy's mistresses, Mary Pincho Meyer, who had been married to Cord Meyer, a top guy at the CIA. Um, she was murdered a year after John F. Kennedy was killed. Uh, she was shot twice while jogging near her Georgetown home. It was like a week or two weeks after the um, report, the, the Warren Commission report had come out on Kennedy's death. And Mary Pinchot Meyer felt that report was a whitewash, and she was ready to talk. You know, she had been married to Cord Meyer. She knew things. They got rid of her. And James Angleton, who I mentioned in connection with Marilyn Monroe, uh, again, head of counterintelligence in the CIA, he was actually found in Mary Pinchot Meyer's home searching for her diary shortly after the death. I think it may have been the day of the death or the day after. And she was found by Ben Bradley, who was the publisher of the Washington Post. He talks about it in his autobiography called A Good Life. So you have this particular player at the CIA, James Angleton, uh, who shows up in connection with uh, the murder of Mary Pinchot Meyer, one JFK mistress, and he shows up in connection with the death of Marilyn Monroe. Um, you know, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of cause for questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, how much research went into doing this documentary? How many, how many years did it take you to do this, to put this together? It took about, uh, two years of research. And during that time, I read every book on Maryland I could get my hands on. I think... I think it was about 30 books that I read on Marilyn, and I narrowed it down to a, a few of them impressed me the most in terms of how they dealt with uh, conspiracy about her death. And uh, I think your viewers might be interested to know which ones caught my attention hmm. particularly. Uh, there's, uh, there's a man named Milo Spiriglio, who was uh, a detective in Hollywood, sort of the detective on all the cases involving the stars. And he spent half a lifetime investigating the case of Marilyn. And he, he concluded very quickly that she was murdered. Uh, he's written a couple books on it. The one he wrote with uh, Adela Gregory called Crypt 33, The Saga of Marilyn Monroe, The Final Word, is really uh, uh, excellent. And he does zero in on the mob complicity actually the mob hit squad uh, in connection with Marilyn's death. But it was after writing this book that he discovered a key CIA document, which is a wiretap of a phone call 
uh, to Dorothy Kilgallen, a uh, sort of gossip reporter at that time and an occasional actress, um, where it some of the things that were top secret at that time that John F. Kennedy had mentioned to Marilyn Monroe and shouldn't have, he revealed top secret information and put her at risk. Uh, and and uh, those things involved uh, the assassination of uh, Trujillo, uh, the attempted assassination, uh, as we were talking about, of Fidel Castro. But it also mentioned the visit of John F. Kennedy to a secret air base for the purpose of examining things from outer space. This shows up in the CIA document signed by James uh, Angleton. Now, why is this so interesting? Well, Dorothy Kilgallen speculated even at that time that this was a reference to the flying saucer crash in the southwest that would be new mexico that would be roswell and that's of keen interest to me because i made uh i was executive producer of and co-writer of uh a now cult classic film made for showtime called roswell uh, that had kyle mclaughlin and martin sheen and dwight yoakam uh, the movie's been on TV uh, around the world, I think, a hundred times. My interest in the Roswell case was always intense. I investigated it deeply. I had access to a lot of the original players. There were two astronauts that gave me inside information. Yes, Roswell happened. I've always believed, uh, since doing the investigation, Roswell happened. It was real. It was extraterrestrial in nature. And there's been enormous disinformation to cover that up. Now, here we have an intersection of that with the case of Marilyn Monroe, where it shows up on a CIA document signed by James Angleton that Marilyn Monroe had been talking about that, that she heard about it from JFK. Now, it doesn't mention it in aliens, but it mentions a secret air base for the purpose of examining things from outer space. And we're, we're talking about back in the year 1962. You know, man hadn't gone to the moon yet. Our own space program was uh, very seminal. And uh, not long after Sputnik, the very earliest days of man in space, very, very unlikely that what it was talking about was examining uh, results of fallen satellites or human things. Not likely. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I came to the conclusion Maryland's life was put in danger by having that information, too. Uh, the CIA saw her as a nuisance they saw a danger that she could talk, and they knew she would attract an enormous amount of attention. So, uh, again, that was another another key piece of this. So you believe that she was killed by the mob as a way to bring down the Kennedys then, in a sense? Yes. I mean, the CIA's intention, I don't think, was to bring down the, the, the Kennedys. But because they had used uh, Sam Giancana and his hitmen on various occasions. I mean, this is historically established. There shouldn't be anything controversial about that statement. Uh, lots of books go over that relationship, Sam Giancana and the Chicago mob uh, and the CIA. So uh, when Sam Giancana was asked to do this, uh, he was able to choose the timing of it. He had access to wiretaps, number one, that... Uh, he knew that uh, Bobby Kennedy had been at her house that afternoon. It seemed a good time to strike because he wanted to bring down the Kennedys. And he was very, very dismayed and disappointed when it didn't have that effect at all. Uh, that uh, there was an immediate cover-up, mainly to hide the fact that Bobby Kennedy had been there that afternoon. Uh, his fingerprints had been wiped clean before there was uh, police investigation uh it did not have the effect that he hoped it would at all but but it was as though he had set up bobby kennedy for entrapment okay okay so what, what's your are you concerned about the political implications about releasing such a documentary now you know, you never know about the timing, the effect that it's going to have. Uh, we're in a very unstable situation politically uh, right now. I mean, uh, we look at uh, the surprise result of the American election for president. 
Uh, we look at some of the statements even that the president-elect has made about uh, his concerns about the CIA and not accepting some of the uh, information uh, from the CIA. You have all these conflicts going on. Um, I think the thing that uh, sort of insulates me uh, here is that we're talking about a history that goes back 50 years. As far as the CIA is concerned, we're talking about what they did then, how they operated, uh, the fact that certain civilian lives were seen as expendable, you know, then. And a lot of books by historians supports, uh, supports this. Now, the, the implication of the involvement with the Kennedys, actually, <clears throat> there have been some authors who have tried to claim that the Kennedys themselves were responsible for Maryland's death, that it was their idea. <clears throat> um, one of the more recent books on that, The Murder of Marilyn Monroe by J. Margolis and Richard Buskin, uh, who is a New York Times bestselling author, fairly recent book. Uh, and uh, their evidence uh, corresponds with mine in many, many ways through this. But where we diverge is that they make the claim that uh, Bobby Kennedy was directly involved in having her eliminated. Um, I don't I don't think they're right on that. I know they were relying heavily on some testimony from the housekeeper's stepson who began talking about this in years later. Um, but I would think that what has preference uh, precedence over that is the confession of uh, Giancana that was delivered through his family, principally in a book called Double Cross. Uh, but one of the family members appeared on television to relay the information of this confession too, and I, I think that uh, that 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 was that was accurate. So then, as far as uh, other concern. Um, uh, Don Burleson, who wrote The Murder of Marilyn Monroe, CIA and the, no, it was uh, UFOs and The Murder of Marilyn Monroe. He was uh, tuned into the Roswell uh, angle on this. He also thought Bobby Kennedy was responsible. Uh, he appears in my movie. Again, I disagree with his conclusion. Darwin Porter in Marilyn at Rainbow's End gives a very good account of the murder and the cover-up. And another one who did a terrific job was Donald Wolf uh, in his book, The Last Days of Marilyn Monroe. And he is one of the uh, only writers besides Burleson who actually was aware of that CIA document that mentioned the secret air base visit by JFK. Um, but he didn't quite know what to do with it. I mean, it was uh, he didn't see the way to integrate that into the findings and the jigsaw puzzle of the clues and the evidence of the murder. Uh, but still, all of those authors uh, in their own right did a good job. I read their books and 25 others, uh, saw almost every documentary, maybe every documentary that was made about Marilyn, particularly that involved her death. And, uh, and, and I took my marching orders from there, put it all together in a way that in an hour and a half, people will feel they know what happened to her. And people who watch my film, Marilyn Monroe Declassified, to the person, everyone who's seen it, who's talked to me, has said, I feel like my questions have been answered. I feel like I know now. So, Paul, um, one question that I'm really, um, it's on my mind right now, is, is how does this actually fit into the body of your work? I mean, you, I mean, you're a filmmaker, and obviously this is a murder investigation in a sense. Um, I, I'm guessing a murder investigation, that, that's, what, has it always been open? Was it, was it ever... You know, closed as as as. Uh, uh, well, yes, yes. I mean, when they declared it a probable suicide, that uh, blocked off a criminal investigation right at the beginning. And when they tried to uh, reopen the case in Los Angeles about twenty years later, and a grand jury was convened, the district attorney uh, Ira Reiner came in to stop that investigation. So. Uh, the criminal aspect of this is murder. It's never been allowed to proceed through official uh, judicial channels. No, it's it's always been been blocked. And again, it's probably you know because of the political families that that were involved. So I think you were asking. Uh, I wanted to say you know how does this 
sort of fit in with that's right work as a yeah as a filmmaker yeah you know, because most of my films have been independent films but uh usually released by nbc universal to uh worldwide television and you know dvd uh, but i've chosen the subjects for my films out of intense personal interest and almost always there's a controversial element to uh, the subjects that I uh, that I pick, and sometimes they involve uh, the underdog, the person who uh, is uh, rejected by the establishment and not believed, but uh, or the whistleblower, you know, who who should be believed. Um, and I I deal with other mysteries. You know, one of my films is, that I'm very proud of is called Jesus in India. An examination of the lost years of Christ and the question of was he in India during that time, which is widely believed in India. Uh, and that investigation involved a six week, 4,000 mile journey across India. And then, of course, uh, we talked about the movie Roswell, highly controversial. To this day, the US government flat out denies that it had anything to do with extraterrestrials. Uh, ignoring the testimony of a lot of people who were directly involved. Um, so that one, a drama rather than a documentary, uh, really made the public aware of uh, that whole controversy. You know, I did a biography of LSD guru Timothy Leary called Timothy Leary's Dead. Again, very controversial. Played at the Toronto Film Festival. Wow, did we have a massive line for people to get into the theater on that. And it was, you know, absolutely sold out. It was very controversial at its time. Um, I did and the Life After Death Project, which you talked to me about, the uh, question of is there evidence that there is survival, life after death, as spirit afterwards. This is another one that in my younger years, I would have said, no, unlikely. Uh, now in... Uh, uh, with a little age and a little more wisdom, I I do believe it's true. And I think that the Life After Death Project and an atheist in heaven make that case very, very uh, strongly. So, uh, you know, there you have it. I mean, uh, there's other movies, too. Uh, Before We Say Goodbye, The Artist and the Shaman, She Dances Alone, uh, and Starry Night about Vincent Van Gogh. So... All over the map, and Maryland fits in because it touches on Roswell, and it has this great political intrigue. And my family was involved with the Kennedys, by the way. My father, in writing for John F. Kennedy, uh, well documented. Check the story of the writing of Profiles and Courage, and you'll see Dr. Jules Davids comes up. So yeah, this project really spoke to me as an important thing to do. Uh, and as something that really could have impact uh, for the memory of Maryland. So, so where can uh, so basically for people to get hold of this uh, documentary film, uh, they go to your website. That's where they would get the copy from. Um, and again, uh, they can email you as well by going uh, to your website and contacting you directly. Well, yeah, I would say MarylandDeclassified.com is the website for getting the film out of the country. If you're in the U.S., Amazon, uh, you know, makes it uh, easy. Um, and uh, lifeafterdeathproject.com uh, has ways you can, uh, I think you can email me there or pauldavids-artist.com. I'll get your messages there. Thank you, Kevin. This has really been interesting. I, I hope your listeners will find it fascinating. Excellent. Paul Davis, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.